Good morning. I want to welcome each of you to our service at Val de Rose and wherever you are, wherever you're watching us from, Pastor Daniel and myself want to welcome you to our service today. God bless you as we join together in worship. I have two or three announcements that I would like to make. First of all, do not forget the musical gifts of inspiration. And this is a gift to our entire community that is being offered by our church on Tuesday mornings at 11 a.m. So please join us if you want to and enjoy the very fine music that is being offered uh, to you uh, through this event. And then we want to be sure that you're aware of the musical event that's coming in September. It's called Christmas in September, and that is going to be on Sunday, September 27, at 3 p.m. So be sure you put that on your calendar. And I might add, don't forget our Wednesday morning meditations. Pastor Daniel and myself have a lot of fun putting those together, and we enjoy bringing them to you. And we hope that if you're watching, uh, they're speaking to your lives in uh, different ways. We also want to let you know again that Charge Conference is going to be Thursday morning, October 8 at 10 o'clock. And as that time approaches, you will be hearing more and more about it. And I also want to share with you that we believe that we're going to be moving toward reopening. We have gotten permission uh, from the bishop and from the leaders at our annual conference that we can begin to look seriously now um, at the possibility of opening, uh, hopefully by November, maybe even by the first Sunday in November. We'll let you know about that, but that's certainly an exciting uh, possibility. And we're anxious to get back with you here in worship, and we'll be having to follow certain protocols as we do that, and we're looking at those and uh, we'll be letting you know how that's all going to play out. But um, God bless you, and God bless all of us as we worship uh, together on this day. And now let us join Robert Richter as he plays God So Love the World. This is our prelude as we begin today.
For God so loved the world. Thank you so very much, Robert, for that beautiful prelude. That certainly creates a mood and an ambiance as we begin our worship time together. Please join with Pastor Daniel and myself as we are led in our call to worship. Whether we embrace God's call in our lives or try to avoid it, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Whether we are long timers or late comers in the life of faith, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Whether our lives in Christ are comfortable or bring hardship. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We praise God's name forever and ever. Our opening hymn, our hymn of praise, is number 140 in our United Methodist hymnal. Let us sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let us join together in one heart and spirit. Generous God, you come to us again and again, no matter how late it is in the day or in our lives, calling to us, gathering us in. You give us your good work to do, daily bread and boundless grace. Increase in us a generous spirit so that we may do your work with joy alongside others whom you also love. We celebrate your salvation, not only in our lives, but also in the lives of other people. Even those we had not imagined would be included in the kingdom you are bringing. Align us with your ways and help us to receive your gifts of justice and mercy as good news. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Today's reading from the Hebrew Bible speaks of the faithfulness of God. It is found in Exodus 16, verses 2 through 15. There, too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for the day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they will gather food, and when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, By evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaints, which are against him not against us. What have we done that you should complain about us? Then Moses added, The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning, for he has heard all your complaints against him. What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. Then Moses said to Aaron, Announce this to the entire community of Israel. Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness. And there they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the Israelites' complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you will have meat to eat, and in the morning you will have all the bread you want. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. That evening, vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is this? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, It is the food the Lord has given you to eat. And now we're going to pause and have some very wonderful special music. Mary Ellen Luce is going to be playing Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us.
The responsive reading from the Psalter comes from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 6 and 37 through 45. I will read the first verse. Join Pastor Larry as uh, he reads the second. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exalt in his holy name. Rejoice, you who worship the Lord. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. Remember the wonders he has performed, his miracles and the rulings he has given. You children of his servant Abraham, you descendants of Jacob, his chosen ones. The Lord brought his people out of Egypt, loaded with silver and gold, and not one among the tribes of Israel even stumbled. Egypt was glad when they were gone, for they feared them greatly. The Lord spread a cloud above them as a covering and gave them a great fire to light the darkness. They asked for meat, and he sent them quail. He satisfied their hunger with manna, bread from heaven. He split open a rock, and water gushed out to form a river through the dry wasteland. For he remembered his sacred promise to his servant Abraham. So he brought his people out of Egypt with joy, his chosen ones with rejoicing. He gave his people the lands of pagan nations, and they harvested crops that others had planted. All this happened so they would follow his decrees and obey his instructions. Praise the Lord. And now join us in our hymn of preparation, number 474. In your home, in your kitchen, in your car, wherever you may find yourself this Sunday morning, join us and sing the words of this beautiful hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
it is a challenge for us pastors, for us preachers, ministers, because we are called to do ministry um, with people. And when, because of the current realities, we're not able to basically interact with a lot of you, it becomes very difficult for us as your pastors. How do we continue to be one-on-one? How do we continue to be relational? How do we remain present with you, especially in the moments of need, in the moments of struggle, in the moments of doubt? How can we become the pastoral presence to encourage, to uplift, to build up, to edify? And I think that time and time again, Pastor Larry and I, throughout our Wednesday or on Sunday morning uh, worship services, we constantly try to encourage you to trust and to believe that God is present. Join us together in prayer. God of unending mercy and steadfast love, we are grateful that you are slow to anger, for there is much in this world that is wrong and set against your purposes. Overcome many of our injustices with your justice. Overtake our lust for revenge with your great mercy. We pray for nations locked in enmity to be set free from old patterns and to embrace a new way of relating. We pray for people who wield economic power to take notice of those whom you notice and to have compassion for those who are vulnerable. We pray for day laborers and the unemployed and the homeless. Inspire us who have enough to share what we have, not in measured and resentful amounts, but gladly abundantly so basic needs do not go unattended gather up the first and the last the least and the greatest in the common work of your kingdom until there is no more first or last at all 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 of us are one in your name Amen. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus, the name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All of our scriptures today and our hymns and All of our liturgy is really speaking to the faithfulness of God. And God's faithfulness comes to us in all of life. And even in this season of COVID, and hopefully as we begin to see our way through this, and as we begin to anticipate coming back to a sense of normalcy within our homes and within our institutions, and particularly I speak of our churches today, We know that God has been faithful to us in this time. And God journeys with us and bestows upon us his grace. And you have certainly done that with this congregation. You have blessed us uh, with your presence during our worship services and meditations on Wednesday morning. You have graced us uh, with your tithes and offerings as we have received them into the office and put them toward the maintenance and uh, 
in running our church during this time, and we just want to say thank you. You are truly a giving people, and God has blessed this church because of you, and God is faithful to you as you have continued to bless our ministries. So join with me in prayer. God of the harvest, we are privileged to be counted among those whom you have called, graced, to have been given your work to do, blessed to receive more than we will ever earn. And so accept, we pray, our thanksgivings and offerings and do what you choose with what we already give but which already belongs to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And now let us listen to Robert Richter as he plays Blessed Assurance for our offertory. The reading from the Gospel today is taken from Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. And this is the parable of the vineyard workers. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At 9 o'clock in the morning, He was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. 
When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more. But they, too, were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Complaining and grumbling makes noise is the title for today's sermon on this Sunday morning. And it comes to you from a parable um, that we know as uh, in chapter Matthew, 20th chapter of Matthew. The parable of the landowner. The parable that incorporates uh, conversations with the workers the day laborers. On Wednesday, we spoke regarding the book of Exodus in chapter 16. And I think the title could also fit there, Complaining and Grumbling Makes Noise. The people in Exodus, as they had left an oasis, they had camped there for a couple of days, maybe a week or so. After they had crossed the Red Sea, they're at an oasis, recovering, recuperating, and it's time to get up and continue on the journey through the wilderness. Such as what we have begun to do through our preaching and teaching on Wednesdays. Uh, teaching about our journey through the wilderness, through the month of September. The Israelites were hungry. They were anxious. They were testy. Uh, they wanted meat. And they begin to recall out of their anger, out of their anxious anxiety, and out of their desperation to eat like they used to eat before, sitting around the buffet tables in Egypt with pots filled with flesh, with meat. Well, that wasn't necessarily completely true. They ate one meal a day. They were slaves that worked all day long. They weren't fed properly. But now that they are out in the wilderness, unknown territory, they have already struggled earlier in chapter 15 in wanting to drink water. When Moses told them where there was water and showed it to them, they complained and they said, it's bitter. It doesn't taste good. Well, Moses called upon God and God told Moses to grab a piece of stick, throw it on the water. And when he did that, the water became sweet. The people no longer were complaining or grumbling. Until a few days later, when their stomach began to make noises, they began to realize that there wasn't anything to eat. And that's, I think, where we have the first time in the Bible that we could say in Exodus chapter 16 is the first moment where they became hangry. They are now wanting to attack Moses and Aaron. They are complaining and grumbling. And eventually, God speaks to Moses and tells him to speak to the people of Israel. In the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 16, is where we begin to see a new identity being given upon the people of Israel. They are now being called the congregation. So the congregation of Israel begins to have quail rain from heaven. And eventually they begin to have bread rain from heaven. When the scripture that Pastor Larry read in uh, chapter 16 of Exodus from verses 2 to 15, it doesn't say manna. The word manna doesn't come until the 30th or 31st verse of chapter 16. Manna in Hebrew 
means, what is it? And that's exactly what they called it. When the bread of heaven was coming down, eventually they referred to it as manna. What is it? There was a purpose that God had to provide them the, the, the quail, to provide them the manna, the bread from heaven. But he told them that you can come out every day and uh, you have two portions for your family. And the next day you have two more portions that you can pick up and gather. And the next day, do not collect, do not gather more than you need. In other words, hoarding was not going to be tolerated. Nevertheless, on the sixth day, they were told, gather what you need for today, but also for tomorrow, because tomorrow is going to be the Sabbath day, the day of rest. So there will be no manna, no quail, no nothing will be open in heaven. The restaurant in heaven will be closed tomorrow. So gather what you can and also for tomorrow. And guess what? Overnight, that food is not going to spoil. And it didn't. Well, some people did not obey, did not trust, did not believe. So they gathered every day more than what they needed. And the next morning, what was left over smell awful. It spoiled. And Moses became very upset at the people that were doing that. But the mentality, the psyche of the slaves of the congregation of Israel for 400 years that had been kept into captivity in Egypt. This is what they knew how to do to grab the scraps and pieces of food and save it. Hold on to it because tomorrow there might not be any more. That's understandable. But God is trying to take them out on a journey through the wilderness to teach them that he will be their provider and he will provide for them daily. Here is the beginning of the concept of wait on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day. You are to rest and trust that the next day after the Sabbath, you will be provided for. Daily, you will be provided. That's why our Lord's Prayer says, and our daily bread. God is trying through Moses and Aaron to teach the congregation of Israel to no longer be caught up with the splitting of the Red Sea or with the cloud or with the pillar of fire, but to begin to somehow enter into a relationship with the God that is providing all these spectacular things. God is also someone that wants to be intimate individually and collectively with the congregation of Israel. And he wants them to know him intimately, personally. So little by little, gradually, God wants to wean them away from not trusting whether their meal is going to come the next day or not because of the mindset, because of the life that they were accustomed to in the days of slavery. Now they are free. Begin to enjoy your freedom. They didn't know how. So they did the next best thing. They gathered, they collected, and they hoarded just in case it won't be available tomorrow. That wasn't trusting God. And yes, complaining and grumbling makes noise. But God heard it and came to them and provided. In Matthew chapter 20, we have the similar approach with the nature of people grumbling and complaining we are told that a parable is literally something cast alongside something else jesus parables were stories that were cast alongside a truth in order to illustrate that truth his parables were teaching aids and can be thought of as extended analogies or inspired comparisons a common description of a parable is that it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A parable is essentially an elaborate allegory. We are invited to see ourselves individually in the story and then apply it into our lives. In the early part of 
his ministry, Jesus had not used parables. Suddenly, he begins telling parables exclusively, much to the surprise of his disciples, who eventually asked him, Lord, why, why do you speak to the people in parables? Jesus explained that his use of parables had a twofold purpose, to reveal the truth to those who wanted to know it and to conceal the truth from those who were indifferent. In the previous chapter, Matthew 12, the Pharisees had publicly rejected their Messiah and blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy of a heart of stone and spiritually blind people. Jesus' response was to begin teaching in parables. Those who, like, those who, like the Pharisees, had a preconceived bias against the Lord's teaching would dismiss the parables as irrelevant, as nonsense, meaningless. However, those who truly sought the truth would understand it. The landowner's question, are you envious because I am generous, in verse 15, is a translation of a Greek idiom, which literally translates as, as follows. Is your eye evil because I am good? An evil eye of Thalmos Poneros suggested a deeper problem than meets the eye. No pun intended. As Jesus taught earlier, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, of Thalmos Poneros, so if you have the evil eye, your whole body will be full of darkness. In this account, the evil eye was the opposite of generosity. It was jealousy, greed, stinginess. As a direct result of this, we covet God's power to forgive and God's control over who is forgiven and how. Remember the story of Jonah? He ran away from God to avoid delivering the message of forgiveness that God had sent him to proclaim. Jonah, grumbling and complaining, said to God, I knew it. I knew it. You are a gracious and merciful God. You are so slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you are so ready to relent from punishing. Are you sure that this is for them? Are you sure they deserve it? Remember, these are the Ninevites. This can't be for them. It is ironic that Jonah, who had earlier declared that deliverance belongs to the Lord, a deliverance he himself has experienced, now has rejected the good news of who God is for others. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard is about coveting, about our frustration with the grace of God, as it applies not to us, but to others that don't deserve it like we do. Coveting lies at the heart of this parable in a couple of ways. We covet what God chooses to give to others. Secondly, in the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, this provides a critical aspect of a New Testament theology. This parable is about the first and the last. The parable itself displays a reversal of expectations. The last will be first, and the first will be last. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their due pay, beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. I was, uh, it, it, it was so interesting to me, as I paid closer attention, that there are five times throughout the day 
when this landowner hired people, the work day, as historians tell us, used to start at 6 in the morning and end at 6 p.m. So at 6 in the morning, he hired the first crew. At 9 o'clock, he hired the second. At noon, he hired the third. At 3 p.m., he hired yet another group. And at 5 o'clock, one hour be before uh, uh, punching the clock, he hired the rest of them. When those hired about 5 o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. When the first came, they thought, oh, they would surely receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled and complained against the landowner, saying, these last ones work only one hour, and you have made them equal to us. To us who have been out there working all day in the heat of the sun. But take notice of this. The last are literally first in that they are paid first. And the first who have labored the longest must also wait the longest to get their pay. But notice as well that the first who are now last do not receive less wages than those who worked only for one hour. They receive the same wages. And take notice of what they said. But you have made them equal to us who have worked all day. So perhaps it should be said that the last shall be first and the first shall be the same. What a scandalous reversal of expectations of our sense of justice and even of our hopes. This concept of the parable is taken up in the other Gospels and in Revelation. It is now a central theme of the New Testament. Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all, Mark 9 tells us. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, it tells us, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. The scandal of this parable is that we are all equal recipients of God's gifts. The scandal of our faith is that we are often covetous and jealous when God's gifts of forgiveness and life are given to others in equal measure. Church, we are being invited through this parable to examine ourselves, to examine each of our lives in secret, just between you and the Holy Spirit. How is it with your heart towards others? Are we envious because they have more or things go much better for them? Or perhaps, are we envious because those that have recently arrived at the church are now beginning to, be, to play a role of leadership? And I've been here for 19 years? It's about the human nature with which we deal with and struggle each and every day. We wrestle with this human nature of ours. And that is why through the preaching and through the teaching and through your own prayer for life is how you and I are going to be able to remain sensitive to the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a beautiful way of whispering ever so gently, nudging us towards God, nudging us to come closer, to draw near just as we are to God so that we would be in his presence. Not that we would expect him, God, to for, for, forcefully appear one day like a lightning in our bedroom or in our living room, but that you and I, we get to take the initiative to draw ourselves near, just as you are right now. There's no need to say, well, wait, I need to prepare. I need to get better. I need to get right. I, I, I need to take care of some, some things before I'm able to draw near. No. 
just as you are. Come. Come close. The Holy Spirit invites you and I to draw near so that God could be close to you, close to me. Through the Holy Spirit, we're going to continue to grow into maturity and continue to grow and rejoice when others that God sees, acknowledges, and bestows his love, his forgiveness, his grace. We will rejoice when we see that. May you continue to trust and to believe. And in closing, please join us. Sing. Sing in your home with us. The words will appear on your screen, on your phone, on your laptop, wherever you may be, in the front seat of your car. Join us for our closing hymn this morning. Number 374, Standing on the Promises. Pastor Larry and I, uh, before uh, in August, began to plan for September because we wanted to uh, walk alongside with each and every one of you on a spiritual journey. 
uh, journeying through the wilderness are the lessons that we are gathering out of uh, Exodus uh, for the months of September. But also, we come on uh, Sunday mornings like today, and we bring a portion of the gospel that makes reference to it. But remember this. You and I also have seasons and moments where we journey through the wilderness. Trust and believe that the Holy Spirit, that the grace and presence of Jesus Christ, and that the love of God is with you. Have a blessed day and be a blessing to many, many, many others. Amen.